begin by reading something from the beginning of Last Child in the Woods that to me has become a kind of prayer. If when we were young, we tramped through forests of Nebraska cottonwoods, or raised pigeons on a rooftop in Queens, or fished for Ozark bluegills, or felt the swell of a wave that traveled a thousand miles before lifting our boat, then we were bound to the natural world, and we remain so today. Nature still informs our years, lifts us, carries us. For children, nature comes in many forms, a newborn calf, pet that lives and dies, a worn path through the woods, a fort nested in stinging nettles, a damp, mysterious edge of a vacant lot. Whatever shape nature takes, it offers each child an older, larger world, separate from parents. Unlike television, nature does not steal time. It amplifies it. Nature offers healing for a child living in a destructive family or neighborhood. It serves as a blank slate upon which a child draws and reinterprets the culture's fantasies. Nature inspires creativity in a child by demanding visualization and the full use of the senses. Given a chance, a child will bring the confusion of the world to the woods, wash it in the creek, turn it over to see what lives on the unseen side of that confusion. Nature can frighten a child, too. And this fright serves a purpose. In nature, a child finds freedom, fantasy, and privacy, a place distant from the adult world, a separate peace. These are some of the utilitarian values of nature. But at a deeper level, nature gives itself to children for its own sake, not as a reflection of the culture. At this level, inexplicable nature provokes humility. The reason that many of you are here today is that you had a special place in nature when you were a kid. And you go to that place sometimes as I go to mine. It is still in your heart, even if the bulldozers finally came. I'd like to say hello to everybody uh, in the audience. Uh, this is uh, I think my third time to speak to an audience in Australia. Uh, I have yet to come to Australia, but I, I'm, I'm going to be coming there soon. Um, but I very much appreciate being asked to speak to you. I know that all of you are working uh, in some fashion with recreation, with uh, many of you are getting kids outdoors, doing a great job of that already. Um, much of what I'll talk about uh, today is uh, applicable, of course, to the United States, but increasingly what is being seen is that this, what I call nature deficit disorder, is a, um, a, a phenomenon that's being seen in many uh, countries, including uh, Australia, uh, Great Britain. Uh, I, not long ago, I even uh, got a news clip sent to me from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, where there was uh, uh, an article about nature deficit disorder there. What nature deficit disorder is, is as I define it in Last Child in the Woods, is not uh, a medical term. It's not a known medical diagnosis. Perhaps it should be, but it isn't. What it is, however, is a way to think about the alienation of children and, in fact, of human beings from nature and the implications of that. This is not an exercise in nostalgia. Uh, for all of human history and prehistory, children went outside and they either played or worked in nature and they spent many of their developing uh, hours doing that. Within the matter of two or three decades, we're seeing the virtual uh, disappearance of independent play in nature. And in fact, we're seeing the fading, certainly in the United States, of independent play in, in, in general whether or not kids get out into nature. Uh, this is going to have profound implications for health, for children's psychological health, for their physical health, and many of us believe for their spiritual health as well. We know this is happening based on many studies. Uh, at least one of those studies is in Australia, uh, found that uh, the, the dramatic drop in the amount of time that uh, kids spend unsupervised in nature. Uh, just within the last uh, 20 years. Uh, 
The reasons that this is happening are complex. Oftentimes, reporters will, will call me and they will want to blame electronics. And uh, it is true that according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, at least 44 hours a, a week spent plugged into some kind of electronic medium for kids in the United States, that's a factor. Uh, you know, when you have uh, people taking their kids to soccer practices in the back seat of the, the minivan and they're watching the flip down screen of National Geographic specials instead of looking out the window at, at real life, at nature, electronics are an issue. Uh, however, it's a little too easy to focus only on electronics and to demonize them. I'm very careful not to demonize video games for a couple reasons. One is, uh, that the minute that adults demonize anything, that's exactly what kids want more of. Uh, secondly, uh, if we focus too much on electronics, then we will ignore or uh, uh, sidestep some of the perhaps even more difficult issues. For instance, the overstructuring of children's lives. Uh, parents, many of us, feel that we have to enrich every second of our children's lives with Suzuki violin lessons and soccer and and all kinds of uh, activities to the point where they don't have much uh, uh, time left for themselves, let alone time to get out into nature. That overstructuring, uh, kids will pay a price for that. One of those prices is what is called uh, uh, executive function. Executive function is uh, what uh, child psychologists refer to the uh, child's ability to control himself or herself. It makes sense. Executive function, you're the executive of your world. It turns out the best way uh, to develop self-control early in childhood is through independent make-believe play. Uh, and I believe that play in nature is even better than, just, than, than many other kinds of uh, independent play. But independent make-believe play, and it makes sense again because you're in charge of your universe. You're the executive in terms of developing executive function. There was a study that was done just a, a few years ago in the United States that showed that uh, comparing kids today to kids who uh, participated in a, the same study in the 1940s, they found that a seven-year-old today um, has the executive function of a five-year-old in the 1940s. That means that we have sliced away about two years of child development in terms of ability to uh, control themselves. Uh, that's a price that I don't think we want to pay. Uh, there are, there's a third reason though, or a third and fourth reason. Third reason is urban design. When we preach constantly to parents to get their kids out and from out in front of the television, we very seldom talk about what the kids should do other than join organized sports. I'm all for soccer. I'm all for organized sports for kids. But we have to remember the greatest increase in child obesity in our history occurred during the same two decades as the greatest increase in organized sports for children in our history. Uh, sports are great for kids, but not if the parents are handing out potato chips and Cokes after the game. And compared to the kind of activity that many of us had as kids, uh, it's not the same as getting home from school, throwing your books on the, on the couch and racing outside to make up your own game. Or like me, to go into the fields and the woods and build your treehouse, build your underground fort and all of that. That's a different kind of expenditure of energy. The, the, the final reason, uh, 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 and perhaps the one that is most intensely felt by parents, this perhaps is most felt in the United States, but I know that it is felt in other countries as well. As parents, we are scared to death of stranger danger. Our parents would tell us, go outside and don't come back in until the street lights come on. In most neighborhoods, that doesn't happen anymore. Some neighborhoods it does, but for the most part, that is gone. Parents are terrified. In, the, in Great Britain, there have been studies done of the, uh, uh, of the number of miles that kids used to be able to go in our grandparents' time from, from home compared to their parents, compared to children today. Children today, it's a matter of feet from the front door. 
so we're dramatically restricting uh, the, the range that children can play in. Some people are even called, talking about containerized kids because from the moment the kids uh, arrive on the scene, they're in some kind of container, whether it's a car seat or whether it's a, uh, uh, one of those things that you, when you run, you race along with it in front of you. Uh, um, kids are not able to have the amount of time that they need just to be kids. Um, this fear that we feel has to be confronted. Uh, when you look at the actual statistics in the United States, you'll see that the actual number of stranger abductions, for instance, uh, has been going down for 20 years. Then why do we feel this intense sense of fear that only seems to grow? I think that my profession, journalism, needs to own some of the responsibility of that, for that. All you have to do in the United States is watch CNN or Fox or any of the 24-hour cable news channels, and you'll see how they take a handful of terrible crimes against children, and they repeat that handful over and over and over again. When they get to telling you about the, the, the crime, then they tell you about the trial over and over and over again. It greatly magnifies uh, the, the sense that on every street corner there is the boogeyman. In every woods, the boogeyman waits. Uh, this isn't doing our kids any favors. It's not doing us any favors. I want to make clear, I'm not saying there's no danger out there, no risk. There is risk. And in fact, there's risk in nature, but not nearly as much as we're being literally conditioned to believe. Some people think that this is some kind of conspiracy. Uh, I don't, because that would attribute too much institutional intelligence to my, uh, my profession. Uh, but it has the effect of conspiracy. Again, I'm not saying there's no risk out there, but we really need to begin to think in terms of comparative risk. Uh, yes, there's risk in going outdoors, but there's a huge risk in raising g this generation and future generations of children under virtual protective house arrest. A risk to their psychological health, to their physical health. Want a real risk? Look at child obesity. Pediatricians are now saying that this generation of children may be the first to die at an earlier age, a lower life expectancy than their own parents. That's a real risk, and that comes directly from the sedentary lifestyle. Uh, there's also or even a risk to community and even to democracy. Believe it or not, it takes going outside and knowing your neighbors and knowing the woods, et cetera, to have any kind of sense of, of community. There's also a risk to the conservation ethic. The studies show that almost to a person, uh, uh, conservationists, environmentalists, had some kind of transcendent experience in nature when they were kids. What happens if that virtually ends? Where will the true stewards of the earth in the future come from? You know, it raises an interesting question. If kids aren't going outside, in the United States, they're not even going outside in uh, places like Ukiah, California, that I visited not long ago. Beautiful place. Spotted owl central. And, uh, spotted owl is an endangered uh, species. It's uh, leading indicator species. But if kids, even in a place like Ukiah, California, up in the woods in Northern California, if they're not going outside there, who in the world is gonna care about the spotted owl or any other endangered species in 10 or 15 years? Um, there's also a, a risk to our children's sense of wonder. I think the most important word in Last Child in the Woods is wonder. I don't know about you, but I remember some of the first times that I had that sense of awe and wonder. One of them was crawling out in the backyard through the grass to the edge of the grass where the trees began and finding a rock and turning it over and finding for the first time that I was not alone in the universe and listening to wind in trees and hearing a presence all around me. One of the things that surprised me when the book first came out is that Religious figures were very, very supportive of it, including some very conservative religious figures in the United States. Uh, I came to the conclusion over time that smart religious people of whatever kind have an intuitive understanding that all spiritual life begins with a sense of wonder. And where does that sense of wonder start? Um, now, at the same time that this bad news has been arriving in terms of the kids' connection to nature, 
a set of good news has arrived as well. Terrific news. Uh, studies are mounting up, finally, the people who study child development have been looking seriously, not only in the United States, but Great Britain and Australia and Japan, have been looking at uh, uh, the benefits of nature for children. Uh, many of these are uh, correlative studies. We don't have the, the, very many of the long uh, longitudinal studies, partly because this issue was virtually ignored until quite recently. But what we're finding out, at uh, the University of Illinois, uh, people doing an ongoing set of studies on children with the symptoms of attention deficit disorder, those symptoms get much better with just a little bit of contact with nature, uh, even kids as young as five years old. Uh, the people doing those studies say that uh, 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 children should, in addition to other treatments, receive nature therapy. I agree with that, but I also ask the question, could it be that at least some of the huge increase in the number of kids being placed on Ritalin and other uh, stimulants, and I'm not a radical on Ritalin, some kids do need uh, medication, but could it be that some of the huge increase in that in the prescriptions that are given for the stimulants. In some schools, 30% of the boys are on Ritalin. Could it be that some of that may have something to do with the fact that we took the calming effect of nature away from kids in the first place? Could it be that at least some of the huge increase in the number of anti-depression uh, de uh, prescriptions that are being handed out, the pharmaceuticals, might have something to do with that? Or that the suicide rate among children among teenagers might have something to do with the fact that we have so radically changed childhood in such a short period of time. Bill McKibben, the great conservation and nature writer in the United States, uh, talks about this being one of the biggest experiments in human history. We're experimenting with a generation of children. 